So today I will be talking about the International Energy Agency's report on carbon neutrality by 2050. If you look at the 2025 layout, the statistic that I see there is on the building side. It says no new sales of fossil fuel boilers. If you're doing renovations in your house, and you understand it's not this ephemeral concept that by 2050, we shouldn't be having any fossil fuel. No, by 2025, we're projecting no new sales of fossil fuel boilers. If you then scroll down and go to 2030, you'll see the stat 60% of global car sales are electric. You know, it's 2021, I graduated from college in 2010. That's 11 years. Time has gone by so quickly. So putting that at my age and through my career path in perspective, 2030 is around the corner. But that means that if I think of buying a car between now and 2030, that car to the best extent possible, if not electric, should at least be hybrid, but hopefully electric. And the closer I get to 2030, I really should be mentalizing myself for any vehicle that I own for myself or my family by 2030, which again, to me feels like here, I really should start to mentalize that that car will be most likely an electric car. Here, this statistic says 60% of global car sales. And I am in one of the sort of highly economically developed industrialized countries in the world more likely that car in the United States will be an electric car. I will have a lot more opportunities, I want to believe, to buy an electric car than, say, other countries where I'm from originally, Costa Rica. I'm hoping that we're there at that point as well. But, you know, understanding the difference in the economies, more than likely the car that I buy in the U.S. in 2030 will be electric. Just starting to grapple with that understanding is, I think, something that might not naturally come to us because of the way the information is being presented to us. I think you see in the headlines in the news, 2050, 2050, carbon neutrality, it's a lot on the politics, it's a lot of, but what will that mean for my day-to-day -day decisions, my day-to-day -day actions? So just thinking that by 2030, just around the corner, I will want to be part of that 60% of global car sales. It's very powerful. My decision to buy an electric car closer to 2030 or in 2030, will really mean that this projection of 60% will be achieved. There's a lot of power in our hands when we look at the data in that way. You wanna be on the right side of that 60-40. Those cars purchased in the next few years are still gonna be on the road after 2040, right? So to meet the CO2 trajectories that the IA is aiming for, they've really gotta get moving in terms of new cars now be more electric so that the fleet will turn over. Yeah, and part of this is also conveying the message to friends and family that this is an exciting transition and that I want to be part of that transition. And when I start looking at this data and I see that I will likely have to buy a car between now and 2030. And when I look at this data, I'm like, wow, if I buy an electric car, I will be part of that transition that by 2030, 60% of our fleet is going to be electrified. It's just exciting to know that there's a way for me to be part of that 60%. So that's all so great. And talking to friends, like we all have to do more. I'm wondering how does this, or does this interact with your work at the Boston Planning and Development Agency? Yeah, it definitely does. A lot of the work that we do is permitting new construction, but it's a planning and development agency. And we have a community engagement a branch of our, our agency and we have a neighborhood planning branch of the agency as well. So a lot of this is having to communicate many of these things back to the community. Also hearing a lot what the community has to say so that we bring that back in and implement this into our work. And so by having these conversations, if we hear what people want to see as part of the work that we do, or if we hear the challenges that people are facing for the type of work that we do. Our responsibility, in my experience, I know that the people that I work with take that very seriously. We take that information back in and really find ways for that to permeate the work that we do. I guess more tangibly, a very specific example is knowing that 60% of global car sales should be electric by 2030. That means that we really need to be thinking about how and where we're gonna be charging all of these cars, not by 2050, but by 2030. 
And so the work that I do, I manage a smart utilities program for the agency, which looks to do utility planning for a lot of these solutions that we need to be seeing is how will we be equipping new construction with the capacity for electric charging? How will we be deploying public electric charging stations across the city? So I collaborate with the transportation department. And so having these statistics in mind and this understanding of where we're going really inform where to put my efforts and which of all the programs and projects that I'm working on, I should be prioritizing. So if I keep scrolling down the report and I get to the 2050 slide, the statistic that jumps out to me, you'll see the chemical recycling reuse. We expect plastic collection or would need to have plastic collection of 54%. That's a huge increase from what we're seeing today, which I believe is in the order of five, six, seven percent of plastic collection. So there's a lot of work that we need to be doing to now and then. And a lot of thoughts when I look at this statistic. One is the reality that we're likely not going to be phasing out plastics completely. I think something that's embedded in this statistic is likely that the amount of plastic that we use in the world will likely have to decrease, just like in anything else that we're talking about. Energy efficiency, new house, the first thing that you want to do is make it more energy efficient, tighten the envelope, then transition to renewable energies. I see this all over the place. And so in the plastics, I'm guessing our goal is going to be to reduce the amount of plastic that we're using with alternatives. But then the plastic that we do end up using, 54% of that will have to be collected to be able to be recycled, reused. And so just understanding that in social media, we're seeing a lot of people just saying like, face out plastic, face out plastic. And that's great. I think we need that work, but understanding what that actually means into the future, that there will be some plastic and that once we do have that plastic, how do we use it responsibly as consumers, the plastic that does remain in the economy? How do we pick among the different versions? And what role will I have to play in making sure that that plastic ultimately gets to be reused and recycled? Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for the invite. This is a lot of fun. And thanks for doing this. It's so cool.